Okay, we're waiting for Rob to join us. Uh, uh, probably are live, but uh, we'll just wait for Rob to also come onto the screen. Okay. So greetings. I think we can start. In the light. Yes, please. Thank you. So greetings from India and a very warm welcome to the plenary of the Western Hemisphere. I'm Chandrika Parma and I'm joining you from Mumbai. I'm the chair of Prime Chapter India. It's rather early and extremely early hours here in India at 3.30 in the morning and probably late evening for many of you. So thank you for so much for joining us and salute to those of you who've been part of this conversation through yesterday. We will, over the next few hours, continue to engage with conversations on the forum theme, accelerating our common agenda. Joining me to welcome you is also Rob Hills, Chair, Prime Chapter, New Zealand and Australia. Rob, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning from Australia. Uh, it's great to have um, colleagues from all over the world and New Zealand as well. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Australian New Zealand chapter, Pyramid. Uh, many of you may know me already. Uh, and Joya Kemper, uh, who also is the co-chair, uh, sends her apologies today. She's traveling at Canada 10 today. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the speakers and panelists today to discuss the challenges and innovations uh, and innovative ideas about how to progress responsible business. Thank you, Rob. You. Rob, the challenge of opening the plenary for Western Hemisphere is a lot of issues and concerns uh, that we will probably be talking about in this, uh, uh, you know, in over the next few hours have also been discussed over the last uh, last few hours. Um, and while we are here, uh, one of the things that has just come up regularly is that sustainability is not a static concept. It's an idea of the future, our common future in some senses. So even as we speak in India, uh, you know, uh, new news reports about from Reuters talk about the ongoing heat waves and it suggests that over 100 lives have been lost and over 25,000 have suffered from heat related illness. The reports are also indicating um, that, you know, we are living in times in South Asia where 314 days out of 365 days, at least one extreme weather event is reported in some part of South Asia. Last year in 2023, many of us saw that South Asia experienced one of its hottest, warmest year uh, since the climate has started being recorded. As the heat wave in India, uh, you know, uh, takes place, the same, at the same time, one sees an increase in demand for electricity, outages in many cities, uh, states of the country. The sales of air conditioners go, goes up. And of course, we all look at ways to cool ourselves. But at the same time, many of the experts also tell us that it is the poor and the marginalized people who have fewer resources to cool down and have even fewer options of staying inside their homes due to the constraint of space uh, away from the heat uh, because they are the ones most impacted. Uh, one, for example, let me say that you know, like when you, there's a heat wave, uh, some from the people impacted, the like, example, the street vendors. Um, if you look at some of the studies that have taken place in the re recent times, it talks about street vendors where, uh, who, you know, the, who've experienced irritability, anxiety, sleeplessness because of this heat wave. And not to say that their uh, daily wages are also impacted. Same thing uh, in a country where a large part section of the population lives on less than two dollars a day. These are just some other instances of systemic inequalities which are part of our everydayness. You know, COVID taught us that while uh, 
there are many things that uh, seem it's it's not so equitable uh, when you know you're facing certain crisis. So while it is apparent that may, there are many uh, global challenges and uh, and climate change itself is a global phenomenon, it will also I think we have to be aware impact vulnerable communities and some geographies probably differently because. Uh, we are seeing and we are engaging with the world, which is influenced by migration, shift in soil quality, uh, impact, uh, impacting cropping patterns. Um, and once those are some of the themes which are covered by and concerns the SDGs. Uh, you know, we're also, I mean, when I'm talking about these numbers and data, uh, one thing that we, I must just put out there is in countries like uh, from global south and especially countries like India, uh, we rarely live in high averages. You know, when I say that India has a GDP capita per capita of 2,000 per annum, it means that there might be some states which might be on 5,000 USD per annum, and there might be some states and certain populations which are less than 600 US dollars per annum. Uh, you know, we also see huge disparities where the women not necessarily are part of labor force, are the women participation in labor force in India stays at less than 25%. Uh, it's, uh, there are you know, it might be of very few states of the 28 states, it would be five states which are responsible for most of the postgraduates. What I'm saying and what I'm suggesting to everyone here is that the sustainable future is not just about ecology, uh, it is, but it is also about social justice and economic equity. Um, and as the clarion call for sustainable futures requires momentum, so does the exploration for methods, materials, and experiments which will contribute to the sustainable ecological and economic model. And these are the things that we've been discussing. Uh, and a lot has been written, a lot has been spoken about this. Uh, and a lot has been over the last, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that the prime uh, chapters across and prime uh, schools, management schools across the country, world, have been doing is talking about how do we embed mechanisms that promote and practice the learning and practicing of sustainability in management education. And we're all part of that discussion of how do we potentially influence and nurture mindset of a generation of students, our personal life size and the way of solving uh, problems. And the, yesterday's conversation saw a you know, lot of these discussions about the sustainability mindset. Rob Van Tilder earlier spoke about how education uh, of the heart is needed through experiential learning. There were also conversations about inner development goals uh, along with SDGs. We were also reminded by Miguel Cordova that uh, the challenges and the wicked problems that uh, will come to us will come through in an interdisciplinary way. And so what we need to embed into our education are comprehensive ways of uh, thinking and doing things. Uh, so these are some of the things that we've been grappling with uh, in many of the management schools. Swati Nagar you know, yesterday reminded us that we need to learn and understand from communities which have lived in conjunction with natures. Over the next few hours, I think we will be continuing many of these conversations uh, in a, com a community, uh, which is the RME community, the Responsible Management Education Community, committed to building a responsible ecosystem and engaging all stakeholders. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next few hours. Uh, Rob? Yeah, thanks so much, Chandrika. It's been uh, very good to have a, a chat with you in the lead up uh, to this global forum to discuss some of these ideas. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I think the more interconnected world that we, we have now, uh, despite having a, slip, a setback uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, means that we actually think more internationally. I know that's happening in Australia and New Zealand in any way. But I still think one of the challenges that we do face in the region uh, is that the, there needs to be a great awareness uh, of the need of responsible business. Um, you know, with the, the pandemic uh, we saw a huge setback in sustainable development goal achievement, particularly around poverty. Uh, and, you know, and I think it was about three years in terms of a setback on that particular goal. Uh, so many businesses uh, prioritise short-term profit over long-term sustainability and social responsibility. Uh, and I think this, this challenge that we have with uh, Peer and Me is centred around a number of things. And we've got a, a session at the end to talk about this as well as a um, talking about a common agenda in the final plenary. But one of the things I'd like to mention now is that um, one of the things that 
Jeremy is great for is about inclusivity, because I think the challenge in this resource scarce century that we have now compared to previous century is that that challenges us physically and philosophically uh, in terms of uh, individual or collective response. And this manifests, it's manifesting right now in terms of, um, you know, how politically and, and business responds to this challenge. Uh, so I think that uh, United Nations PME has a, a really important role to be able to reset this mindset into the collective area. Uh, yeah, and I also just want to acknowledge um, uh, Global Compact uh, and our priority areas in that area in human rights, labour, environment with biodiversity, climate change, anti-corruption focus. And it's really timely to remind ourselves of these priority areas uh, to be able to focus a lot of our work in education to embrace those uh, aspects. And as part of that, I just want to highlight um, some work here done a few years ago now uh, by the Global Compact Network Australia on a business reference guide to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, and that guide, and there are many other guides with uh, Global Compact that can help us and help us teach uh, for the respecting the rights of Indigenous people. And uh, on that note, I'd just like to uh, introduce Kerry, who's also here in the panel. Um, so hi, Kerry. Uh, I'd just uh, love to introduce you um, as a friend and colleague. Uh, Associate Professor Kerry Bodel uh, is a passionate advocate for empowering young Indigenous people and in transforming business education. Uh, through Australia and also Griffith University, she's provided leadership in transforming business curricula using storytelling, co-design approaches and creates pioneering standalone courses and brings greater understanding of Indigenous history, knowledge and culture uh, across the university curriculum and spanning out across universities now. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, really uh, highlights the great work that she's done uh, is that recently her work has been acknowledged with an award for teaching excellence, uh, receiving the Neville Bonner Award for Indigenous Education and Business Management and Commerce category at Universities Australia. Uh, and yeah, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Kerry today to talk to us about uh, Indigenous competency and working together. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, and um, thank you uh, to PRME for the invite back to um, present the um, the plenary. Um, just bear with me while I um, go in and share my screen. I'll just go back in and do a... Um, sorry if I'm holding everybody up. I had this working and <laughs> now I've just got to go in and um, open up the shared screen. All right, so share access and here we go. Okay, so good morning, everybody. And um, just, this is just a shot of um, was taken down at uh, in Canberra when I did win the award um, for the Neville Bonner. And I, I think for everybody um, uh, who doesn't know who Neville Bonner was, he was um, one of our first Indigenous um, uh, colleagues that, uh, and one of our mob, as we call them, um, to be uh, made senator. So he did his first degree at university. Uh, becoming a, a lawyer, and then he was um, obviously, you know, promoted and and worked right through into our um, our government system. And so there's a um, a national award each year that's given to, you know, the, the person that has done uh, the most impact in um, transforming um, our in, um, indigenous education. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, um, you know, our our country and this is something that we do in Australia and this is something part of our reconciliation uh, agenda in that we pay respects to our local traditional custodians and that's the people who were here 
um, at the date of, uh, of the landing of Captain Cook. And we go back to making sure we respect, um, you know, the, the land in which we're meeting. And so across the globe, I'd like to acknowledge the your traditional um, custodians and the elders that you have past, present and emerging. So this is just a, a capture of our, um, you know, of, of your PRME mission and how I, I'm going to talk about how this can be, um, you know, not in that word there to transform management education. And I think the next level is to see where, um, where my agenda in advancing Indigenous knowledges to transform education at a university level is possible to be able to um, apply that um, to the, uh, the management education that uh, PRME has. Now, I came across the um, this in my searching around to try and look for, because I love pictures, and I think if anyone knows about Indigenous culture, we tend to go more for pictures rather than lots of writing and, um, and talking. Um, so this is a westernised, developed, you know, presentation, but I liked the way that, you know, first off, just to see well, what does decolonise our education mean? Because this is one of the things that we're tossing um, and around, whether we decolonize it, which I think people would think that's just to take out everything that is Western and start again. And then you look at with an, um, an indigenize. Do we keep the existing framework or do we just uh, recreate a whole new set of uh, ways of teaching our education program? And I'm in the strong belief, and, I, and probably because you see that I'm white, it, it, it might be very um, confusing for a lot of people, but my background is that my mum was part of our stolen generation. Um, she was born in Sherberg, not far from uh, where I am in um, the Gold Coast, Queensland. And she was taken from there when she was at the age of three. And so my passion and mission has been about, you know, finding my culture. And I've actually, I call myself the accidental academic. I've rolled into doing an accounting degree. I've done a PhD. Um, but all along, it was never really my passion. And so I've co come into this, um, you know, uh, where I've gone into doing a, an accounting degree, no Indigenous content whatsoever, always asking the question, the so what? You know, where's my culture? Where do we fit into the economy? Where do we fit into our education programs? And so by asking that question, um, I was championed by the Dean Learning and Teaching at the time in 2013 to create an Indigenous business course. And that has evolved over time to um, a couple of years ago, we actually um, had to reconstruct um, our, and redesign our Bachelor of Business. So it was my role to lead the first people's themes. So everybody that was reimagining a whole new um, foundation courses, there were seven of them. I'd sit down with them individually and, you know, give them the cultural tour of it's going to be okay, you know, I'm here to work work with you. Um, this is something that you're the expert in. I'm just about not just putting a tokenistic couple of pieces into your, your curriculum. This is about expanding and giving and empowering you to understand how you can rebuild your topics each week, how to look at your assessments, how to feel culturally safe while you're teaching, provide you with resources and, and the like. So as you can see from this slide, it's really about embedding some of the pedagogy and some of the uh, teaching practices that I developed over time and doing it together. So in looking at PRME, how are we going to move forward? And I know that the underpinning um, SDGs that are really uh, relevant for this is really about SDG 10, so reducing um, inequalities, giving community voice and in our decision-making, and obviously the uh, connection to land. And so when I gave that, that um, acknowledgement of country, it's really the respect and connection that our Indigenous people have with land. And it's not just land, it's also country. So country being not only just what you can touch and feel, it's also part of our, our landscape, our stories, it's the, our traditional practices, everything that's happened with Australia has been over 65,000 years. Um, and then we also need our SDG 16. So we're looking at, um, you know, obviously the, the governance of peace, justice, et cetera. So how do we take that and make sure that we've got that stewardship and we've got that respect that we have for intellectual and spiritual assets? 
So I see this as a brick wall. Um, I see the brick wall that was built with Western um, ideology and frameworks. And don't get me wrong, I mean, we, we had to have somewhere to start, but it was always built, in my eyes, with this, um, with this crack in the wall. So I propose that if we want to rebuild our PRME education modules and programs, we really have to take it, well, who is this for? This is for our managers, our leaders, everybody that's had some form of education missing with our Indigenous knowledges and practices. We need to now look at if we've we've got to start um, again, if none of our, um, our schools, primary schools, high schools, universities have not had any Indigenous knowledges and content throughout their business program, then we've got to not only one introduce that at this higher level for managers, our leaders of the, the of the future world, we have to now create something that's going to be scaffold into this program. So I, I suggest that we um, look at what can we do to rebuild this wall with the First Peoples? You know, um, are we looking at, you know, initially sort of looking at starting off with the history, respecting localised, and this is where I really emphasise, this has to be based on where you live because it's the traditional custodians and owners of that land that have the history. They have the secrets of how we can reach that sustainability future because um, we're looking in Australia at going back to land management, bushfire management, how do we eat, um, you know, and come from our flora and fauna and do the sustainability practices that we know historically, the secrets are there, the solutions are there. So we come into how do we create all the programs of communication, our HR programs in looking at people, now, that is the essence that I always come from because we've got so much um, emphasis on um, mental health, well-being, and how do we manage our people. They are the key stakeholders in, in our education program. And as managers, we need to know that when we're given a program of leadership at the highest level, we have to first identify if you've got a mission for your organisation it has to have that value embedded um, idea of where your um, traditional and Indigenous people um, can be included in the process. So the reconciliation of that. How do we break that down into your strategic, um, you know, action plans and in enforcing, not enforcing, I, I don't like that word, but, you know, peeling that down and threading it through all your um, action items to your managers, your line managers. How does our supply chain include Indigenous businesses? How do we um, look at bringing back some of the social social benefits that go back to community? How can we build this up as, as um, future leaders in our organisation? Um, and yeah, and I think when I've looked at the, the next um, couple of um, present presenters, they will be speaking on exactly those areas that we, we're looking at. And I want you to think that when you go through each of those um, presentations, how can we include the Indigenous uh, perspective and lens on inclusivity to address additionally, you know, things like marketing, like I've done some um, a paper on um, healthy eating and, and bushfire management in social marketing. So there's always something that we can add in um, the research that's been done here, um, as well as with with Rob, we've done some work recently. Uh, keep an eye out for some of the things that we publish and that can help you find ways and, and means of community of practice in teaching and where to and how to um, adopt your localised um, research as well as that internationally. So I'd like to um, thank you again for allowing me to come in. I know we had a bit of a, a touch last year or the year before when it, it got a great uh, response and it was then brought to the attention, let's bring Kerry back and um, give her a plenary um, sort of sort of spotlight. And I hope I've done that justice. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. And we've got just a, a couple of minutes, so I might actually ask you a question. Uh, and it it has been a privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, a privilege to work with you on some of these, uh, uh, some of the work that you've been advancing. Um, so, uh, as a non-Indigenous person wanting to advance uh, curriculum or pedagogy or or engage with this, is are there any tips just in the last minute? 
Yep, I'd say co-design, co-design, co-design. And uh -huh. it's always about, because once you start co-designing with um, with Indigenous people, they might not be educators, they might not be, you know, like got PhDs or whatever, but they will bring in all the resources that you need and they will actually talk to you through storytelling, which is one of my pedagogies. By talking about the, um, you know, our experiences, we're able to... Um, even come on a relatedness uh, journey. So we can touch on how can we adapt your practices with a storytelling and how can we adapt, you know, some really interesting and innovative ways of um, co-creation of resources. Yeah, fantastic, Carrie. And just on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, it's been fantastic to get you to, to give us some insights into how uh, all the great work you've been doing at uh, Griffith University and across other universities as well. So thank you so much, Kerry.